Hi, everybody. Welcome back. So glad that we're here to continue the talks about going beyond money. We're not stopping now because we're about to have a really great conversation, continuing the themes on building generational wealth and investing in your legacy. You're here to hear from three millennial women on modern wealth and how they are redefining wealth as millennial women, sharing their money stories and how they are reshaping what wealth means for themselves and of course, a generation of women. First, I'd like to bring to the stage Danica. Danica Nelson is a multifaceted creator and marketer specializing in finance. By day, she works at Shopify as a senior product marketing manager, and her role is to help entrepreneurs better manage their business finances. By night, she creates money-focused content with the goal to help Black, Indigenous, and women of color feel confident about their personal finances and learn how to make their money work for them. Next, we have Janine Rogan. She is a CPA, a fellow CPA. She's a financial educator from Calgary, Alberta, and she's, she's a passionate keynote speaker on the topic of financial feminism. Her company, the Wealth Building Academy, educates and empowers women to take control of their financial future. For the last decade, Janine has been writing and speaking about money, most recently launching an investing course called the Wealth Lab. It's to teach individuals how to invest. Her TED Talk X at YYC, uh, TEDx YYC Talk, Reimagine Finance for Millennials, aired in June 2021. Last but definitely not least, Janie, Janie Vuz. It's Janie Vuz is, you know, let's talk a little bit about her. Upon moving from Nigeria to Canada in 2015 for postgraduate studies, Janie was met with a lot of culture shock and a new identity, being Black. That experience led to her passion to support newcomers to Canada, navigate career, business, and money, and most recently, the creation of her startup, Education an education and career network startup supporting immigrant careers through learning, community, and recruitment. By day, she is head of the Black Innovation Programs and Partnerships at, at the DMZ. I don't think we're allowed to say the university name right now, but Ryerson DMZ. So welcome these three women to the stage. I'm so excited to have them here for this conversation. And let's let's start off getting to know a little bit more. We gave some formal buyers, but of course, share a little bit more. Let's start with Danica. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience about money growing up? Absolutely. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. Really excited to be here and have this discussion. Uh, so me growing up with money, um, I grew up to a single immigrant mother um, in community housing. We definitely didn't have a lot, but we had enough. Um, but I still was uh, able to see kind of how my mother struggled with money. And I think that that really uh, set the tone for how I would work with money um, in my future and kind of how I would manage money and make money. I also had a sister who was 10 years older than me. So she was already in university already was taking on student loans and I saw like the impact that that I had on her and I knew from the beginning I do not ever want to be in debt I do not ever want to take on student loans and it was just really really important for me to not get in that place um, I realized recently that I was kind of brought up in a scarcity mindset when it came to money like there wasn't a lot we tried to save a lot and we didn't want to spend a lot um, and as I've kind of grown older, I realized I've been trying to shift my mindset from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. So, you know, really getting out, out of that place of thinking you can only save and now thinking about, okay, how can I invest? How can I make my money work for me? And how can I, you know, live that freedom and not live in a place of being afraid of money? Oh my gosh, so many things you said there, you know, <laughs> just like resonates and I know it's gonna resonate with a lot of the people in the audience. So again, you guys type your comments in the chat. We wanna hear from you and what you're saying. I really liked what you said about, you know, me too. I grew up in, an, in you know, uh, the daughter of immigrants from the Caribbean, you know, community housing. And yeah, it really does shape your mindset and it really does not let you know that maybe the generations before and what you learned are not going to help you on your your go forward plan. 
So let's hear a little bit from Janine. Janine, tell us a little bit about your money story. What were some of those messages that you had growing up? Yeah, when I was growing up with money, I felt like it wasn't really talked about that much. Like it was still this taboo topic that wasn't really brought up. So my parents always told me like, oh, you know, make sure you're saving money for a rainy day. But that's kind of the extent of the money conversations we had. And I remember saving money and, you know, going to the bank with my little bank book and putting it in the, um, the little machine and it would do the little, I don't know what that noise is called, but, um, and, you know, I, I liked the idea of the bank giving me some money, but then kind of as I grew a little bit older, I remember wanting to spend that money and, you know, buy these things that were in magazines and, um, I, I didn't want to save money. So, you know, I ended up uh, second year university with basically no money in my bank account after working like full time during the summer. And I was super fortunate that I was living at home uh, with my parents while I attended university. But, you know, I remember thinking, okay, I just worked really hard all summer with a pretty good paying job at the time and I have nothing to show for it. So that really started to shift my mindset. And then a friend of mine actually lent me the automatic millionaire and I was reintroduced to this notion of, of compound interest. And that's really what set my, uh, I guess, passion for, for building wealth and um, you know making my money work for me. Very interesting. Yeah. Like I think the seeds of it, you talk about, you know, growing up and parents telling you to save, but then you can't just be saving all the time. You need to spend. Can you tell me a little bit more about that friend? I'm always really interested in how people get introduced into money and investing. Was it uh, a male friend, a, a, a girlfriend who kind of, kind of helped you, you know, seed that first thoughts on that, uh, that book on automatic millionaire? Yeah, so I had a friend in university um, who was in uh, the faculty of education and she ended up taking, um, they're called he call courses, so human ecology at the university we attended. And so she ended up at, like taking one of these personal finance, human ecology, I think it was called family finance or something like that. And we were just talking one day and she said, you know, I'm really enjoying this book and I think you would like it as well. And she lent it to me. And that honestly is kind of where it all started. Wow. Okay. Great. Great. And Janie, Janie, can you tell us a little bit about your story? You know, how not only you grew up outside of Canada, but coming to Canada and how did that kind of shape your money story? And it's funny because even though I grew up outside of Canada, I have a lot of similarities with Danica and Janine in their money story. Um, I grew up first daughter to two parents, um, a military dad and a very hustler mom. And so my dad is a very good saver. He, again, in the Nigerian culture, the man is supposed to provide. So he will never mess with tuition money or money that goes for the kids. My mom, on the other hand, at any given point in time, including this moment, is probably doing four things, four businesses. So she was a little bit more risky um, with money, as my dad would put it. However, being first daughter, I was also a lot in charge of a lot of the affairs that um, that concerned my other siblings. So I was very much privy to the money conversations earlier on in the family. So I always witnessed not having a centralized resource. So it was, we didn't have a family budget. It was, you go to mom, mom goes to dad, and then there's a tense conversation and you need to pitch your case every time you needed an, an ask. And so what I saw was some tense moments when it comes to handling money, mom and dad not talking as both of them not knowing who has what dad believing he has to provide mom is like i will supplement where dad cannot provide and so he taught me my dad taught me very early on how to be a good saver how to be in charge and control my finances and i was also lucky to have my brother who moved to canada more than a decade before me and similar to danica's story of our older sister he's older he came when he was a teenager he racked on all the student loans so i had my big you know who i was not going to be when i moved to canada and so being a good saver i graduated university with more than a million nigerian air, which is not normal for most nigerian kids but i had it all saved up because i was so fearful of being in a tough situation which i had seen a lot of family members get into 
Um, also, there was also the notion a lot of um, ultra wealthy people in Nigeria sometimes have their hands in dirty things. So there is this look that if you're rich, um, you got it from a way where it's not so good. So looking to be ultra wealthy wasn't a goal. It was more get comfortable and not have to um, be able to spend what you need and just be okay. So that was pretty much like what we aimed for and not thinking about generational wealth of sorts. Um, so when I moved to Canada, I just would talk to, I'm, I'm, I'm generally a very curious person. I just ask questions, how people spend money. I had saved a lot. I'll talk a little bit later about how I had to pay my own tuition. I think that was my wake up call because I had depleted a lot of that savings and I needed to figure out how to grow it. So I started having a lot of conversations. I'll ask people about how to save money, how, how to grow their money. If I saw a kid who had a house my age, I'm like, how did you do it? That was how I was, um, and I read some books, like my dad made me read Rich Dad, um, Poor Dad very early on. And this Asian Egyptian book about some, some good saver guy and how to make your money work for you. And so I was always just curious about how that would work. And as soon as I knew that as soon as I started working and making income, I needed to figure out how to make that money work. I was very risk averse though. So it's a thing I had to unlearn. And so I'm learning and teaching myself how to grow money, how to make it. And now another new level is how to leverage other people's money. That part's scary, but I'm so excited for it. <laughs> Danica, I see you like uh, shake, nodding, nodding along to a lot of the things the woman said, and they gave some book recommendations. Anything you want to add in there in terms of upbringing and mindset, you know, uh, to add to the conversation? Yeah, I would just say I, I love that your mom is the hustler that would probably be doing all of the things. That's definitely who I am today. It's not who I was brought up to be, but I think it's such a great mindset to be brought up into because it really just sets the pace and the tone for you know your your financial future. So I I just love it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So as women, you know, we enter the workforce, you know, we are all come out of our education programs, like hoping to, you know, climb the corporate ladder, get secured in positions. But sometimes that's the first place where we enter real conversations about what we are paid and what we are worth. I'm wondering if you guys could share a little bit about your stories about entering the workforce and strategies or blocks about getting paid what you are worth. Uh, let's start with, let's start with Janie. Janie, can you tell us a little bit about that? I would love to. So first things I had, um, I, I got wind of was when I moved to Canada is, uh, foreign exchange. Cause what you're worth in a different country is different from what you're worth in another country. And so, and that's what I coach a lot of immigrants about. Like people come here for their first Canadian job and they're so excited to get 40 K for a senior level role, because by the time they convert it to Nigerian there, they're millionaires. And I'm like, hold up. <laughs> so I think the first thing I had to do really was do a lot of research. So I, unlike most new immigrants, actually had the privilege of going to three different levels of education after my undergrad in Canada. So I was exposed to a whole network of people in different industries, the first of which was advertising. First of all, it should have been a red flag when I joined the program in, in day one and found out I was the only black girl. But I wasn't thinking, I didn't realize I was black then. So I didn't understand what was really the issue with the industry. <laughs> it would take me two years to realize that advertising is very white and also is severely underpaid. But honestly, Jesus saved me because I would go to the agencies and they would not want to tell me I'm overqualified. But also the salary was not even, I will say I wasn't able to pay my bills with a salary. So quickly I had to pivot. I went back to tech. And so it was a lot of conversations, a lot of networking and a lot of research. I would research salary levels, use all the tools, the glass doors. I, and then I, I had to get mentors because I, a lot of times when people would tell me what I'm worth, I wouldn't even believe them. Cause I was, I was just, at first I was just so grateful to get a yeah. job because listen, I'm making my mama proud. I'm in Canada now. Right. And so it took a lot of practice saying those big numbers in front of the mirror and like making sure I don't flinch as soon as I say it. But it took a mentor telling me, when you go to that new job, ask them for this amount. I go, what? She says, yes, say it. And I was like, okay, I can do this. <laughs> and so <laughs> that was how I started getting comfortable talking about my worth and my value. And that is as a professional. Now as an entrepreneur who also has multiple skill sets in the myriad of things, is being able to actually itemize them and find out what the value is. I don't realize that my ability to run 
a virtual event is something someone is willing to pay big bucks for because I just do it so easily. So I, I would say for me, it's a continuous learning journey um, on understanding my value, my worth, but opening my questions. I always say close my mouth doesn't get fed. And just surrounding myself with a group of women and a support system who are also able to share, but um, are willing to practice with me has been my way of navigating my value and my worth. So many gems there, so many gems, you know. Danica, can you add to the conversation? I know on your Instagram page, you talk a lot about salary negotiation. We, we want share, share a little bit about your experience. The tea. Absolutely, yes. I will start by saying, first of all, prefacing, I love my mother. However, because <laughs> I think that, you know, the background that she came from, um, you know, being an immigrant new to Canada, when she secured her job, she was very much of the mindset that you stay at your job for your entire career, you don't ask for more, you don't cause any trouble, just stay there, take what they give you, and that's it. And that, that was my example, right? So I'm just very grateful that I found the internet and I found, you know, people on Twitter and people on Instagram or, you know, just whatever social network was cool at the time who were kind of a, an example of something completely different, you know, people who were black women who were working in tech and, you know, asking for what they were, were worth, like that was like a huge game changer for me. Um, in the beginning though, you know, I did accept the first offer, which I regret all the time, just because I was like, wow, I'm just happy to be here. I'm happy that, you know, I'm even being offered a job right now. Uh, similar to you, Janie, I went to a program. I was, I studied radio and television arts and I was the only black person in the program. <laughs> and I realized very quickly, like, oh, I don't know if this is gonna work out. And also I started seeing that uh, jobs in that field were not very consistent. Layoffs were very common. And that's just that's not really right. what I wanted to do. So I made a quick switch to uh, marketing and communications and that's where I am now. But yeah, ever since then, you know, after, you know, accepting my first offer, I realized, you know, always do your negotiations, uh, practice in the mirror, similar to what you said with these big, bold, audacious numbers. Uh, something I also do very frequently is uh, YouTube. Uh, there's a lot of uh, YouTube negotiation, like mock videos that you can watch to, you know, see, okay, what would be, um, you know, some uh, people who are trying to say, no, you know, you can't have this, you know, how do you overcome those objections? Like doing those have kind of helped me learn to negotiate and be prepared for those conversations. Um, and yeah, also just really working on my personal brand, you know, having like a brand online that is memorable and that gets me paid, you know, I don't even have to introduce myself sometimes because people know who I are. They know what value I can bring to any product or project or organization. Um, so that kind of helps set the tone for my salary expectations as well. That's right. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. I like that first piece about, again, how it was done before as a generation of women is not necessarily how it works today. You know, I often say to people, loyalty is overrated, <laughs> overrated, <laughs> you know, loyalty to your family, loyalty to your communities, but to an employer, overrated, overrated. Um, so <laughs> I'm so glad you shared a lot of those things. Uh, Janine, you know, you come from the finance, the accounting space, right? Often a space where it's a lot about time, time being what you are valued for, as opposed to maybe your overall contribution. Can you share a little bit about workplace money management negotiation? Yeah, and I mean, you ladies have said so many things that I've resonated with. I mean, my parents were both of the mindset that, you know, just keep your head down and you'll get rewarded if you work hard. And that's just not the way it is right now. Um, I remember working at uh, one of the big four accounting firms and I was training a man and um, we were talking, it was about that time of year where salaries and promotions are happening. And I was training this new guy and he was coming into the same role. I think we were both senior accountants at that point. And I got talking with him about um, money and salaries. And I found out, um, and I still say like, bless him for sharing this with me. Cause I think it's something that more men and also um, white people need to do to make sure that you're having those conversations with uh, underrepresented or underserved groups of people. But I found out I was making $13,000 less than he was. Woo! And I was training him for the same job I was doing. So I was pretty pissed. <laughs> and I used it as a, 
Uh, yeah, I rightfully I was pissed. And so I used that to um, go back in and negotiate um, at, at raise time. But I think, you know, what you said there, Leanne, um, about time um, in the accounting field, and I think in the law field as well, we have to build down to the, the point one of an hour. So that's every six minutes. And you're kind of expected to be productive for all of those minutes every hour. And it, you're really only rewarded by how many hours you work. Which, if you think about it, it's kind of counterintuitive to being productive, right? There were so many people that would always fluff their hours. They would finish their work in two hours and they would say, oh, it took me eight because there was budget for eight hours. So I love to see like death of the billable hour and really start paying people for all of the experience they have um, in the workplace. So, you know, when I am kind of working with clients one on one, you know, and we're talking about, you know, speaking at a conference or coming in to do a session, you're not paying me for the one hour of my time. You know, I'm not going to charge you $250 an hour. That's just a made up number. I, I, I need to be paid and compensated for the 10 years of experience that I have put in and research and all of those things that I've built in my business. And I think that that is definitely how I would like to see things go. But um, I know accounting and some of those other industries are a little bit slow to change sometimes. We're changing it. We're changing it. And we need to, you know, definitely, definitely. I had someone, you know, really change my life with coming in over and uh, reorganizing my closet. And, you know, it took her not too long because that was her skill set. But the value that she gave to me to show up as a boss was like so transformative. And that's what I'm really paying for her expertise on. Um you know, speaking of like, um, you know, expertise, building up, you know, wealth, really thinking about worth, how did each one of you get started in building wealth? A lot of, for a lot of people, you know, it could be investing, it could be real estate, a lot of different ways. I'm interested in how you got started building wealth. Um, Janine, let's talk, let's talk to you a little bit about that. Yeah. So after I read this book, this automatic millionaire book, I was understanding this notion of compound interest and your money can grow. And I was extremely fascinated by it. So onto the internet, I go to try and figure out what all these things are. And into RBC, I walk with my client card. I didn't have my, there, I think bank books were not a thing at that point. So I was 19 and I walked in and I said, like, I need to invest. I need to have an investment. I need a TFSA or an RSP or something like that. And I think the the guy at the bank, which I think a lot of people have this experience, kind of just walked me through a couple things and he made me take that little risk questionnaire. And I said like, oh, I don't want to lose any money. And so <laughs> I ended up in a mutual fund that was not any good for me. I'm sure the fees were astronomical. Um, there was way too much fixed income in that. And so it really was a, a process of self-learning because even as a CPA, we're not really taught this in business school or even really in our designation. Um, you know, we're taught how to run companies. We're taught how to balance the books. We're taught how to make income statements and tax returns and all of those great things, but we're not taught how to manage our personal finances. So for me, it was a big self-learning journey. And then as I kind of started to understand things more and more, I was like, okay, this RBC mutual fund is no good and ended up, you know, moving that somewhere else. But yeah, that was really how I got started in building my wealth. Amazing, amazing. And Danica, can you share a little bit, the good, the bad, the ugly of how you started off building wealth? Absolutely. So I'll start from as young as 13 years old. Uh, as I shared earlier, I wanted to start making my own money as soon as I could because I didn't really want to add to the burden of my mother trying to figure out finances. So I got a job at McDonald's <laughs> um, and, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a normal, you know, t early teenager part time job where you just worked a few hours like I was working like 20, 20 hour weeks and that just kind of slowly started increasing. Uh, but that kind of helped me start saving. Um, and that's where I really started understanding, OK, this is how you make money and this is how you can, um, you know, bring value to the family so you don't really have to add as a burden to anyone else. Um, and then when I was 18 years old, I got my first part time job at or sorry, I got a job at TELUS um, and they gave us the offer, the opportunity to buy shares. So I was able to dedicate six percent of my paycheck as much as six percent of my paycheck 
uh, to buy, to invest in company shares, and they would match that. Uh, I honestly, I'm going to be honest, I started on by an accident. I didn't really know what I was doing, but my manager at the time, he's like, he's like, just do it. It's a good idea. Trust me. So I'm like, okay, that sounds like a great idea. And I'm so grateful that he told me to start doing that because it just added up, like similar to what Janine said, that compound interest, it just started adding up. It added value to my overall uh, net worth. And eventually I was able to use all that money that had accumulated because I had worked there for 12 years uh, to buy my first home. So um, I bought my first home, my condo in downtown Toronto at 25 years old. Um, that was great. And I was also able to use that money to pay for my full university tuition as well. So I was able to graduate without any student debt. So those are two things that I'm really proud of. Amazing, amazing. If anything we learn here, ladies, compound interest is your BFF. All right, get started with the compounding. <laughs> <laughs> Janie, Janie, can you tell us a little bit how you got started building well? Yeah, no, first of all, super inspired by Danica and Janine's story. And I, I don't know if what I have is wealth, but we'll, we'll try. <laughs> um, so I think the first thing was understanding, first of all, on, on learning that wealth is not an enemy because um, that was something that was culturally rooted um, in just being comfortable is okay. You don't have to be wealthy. And so I knew that I was already a good saver. I, I grew up with good saving principles. I legit never had borrowed money from anyone. It's something I used to say very pridefully and now i'm learning that you know, you're not doing it right you should leverage other people's money anyways moved here um i knew that i was going to learn from other people's mistakes starting with my brother who had the incredible debt and so i knew that i wasn't going to take debt because of the credit system i needed to learn that as well and so when i was done with my first two programs my dad couldn't support my mom and dad couldn't support with my master's program so all that savings that i had made i had to use and i started picking up jobs on the side i was making hair whipping body butters to pay my tuition for my master's program, which a lot of people told me was stupid at the time. But again, I, that was my very first investment because I was choosing a top school in Canada, which I knew I could get a good network from. So that was my first investment, which was not necessarily monetary, but also monetary because I paid tuition from money I wasn't making. And so that was about 60K. And I knew that I was, when I looked at the interest and I did, I love to do calculations and saw how much more they were gonna charge me over time. I knew that I was in a race to pay that thing before the grace period ends. And I was able to pay that debt in less than a year. It was crazy, but I did it. And so that was my very first step in building wealth, making sure I didn't have any debt. And then also just being insatiably curious about how other people are doing it. And I'm a DIY queen. I always try stuff myself. And then if I absolutely hate it, I'll just outsource it. Um, and so I wanted to, as soon as I understood, I started reading stuff about um, wealth um, vehicles, like what TFSA means, RSPs mean. I started taking in a lot of YouTube videos. I actually also sought the help of a financial advisor just to put everything down in perspective for me, what I, what's possible, what to do, what not to do, just so that, um, because when, you, when you're learning on your own, you sometimes, you don't know what you don't know. So you can just be in this small pigeonhole, not knowing that there's this other piece to consider. And for me, that was understanding the, the, the importance of life insurance before you start even investing because you can, or um, accidental insurance, things of that sort. So that was a big aha moment for me. And then going forward, I started playing, literally playing with uh, buying stocks um, off the index funds. And then someone told me about Wealth Simple. I was like, okay, I've heard about this thing two, three years. I, I might as well just try it. And that was how I started um, investing. And I'm building wealth. Now we're looking to get into real estate, get a property because the, the market right now in this place is only going to go up. And just looking at the, the immigration rules, Canada wants to have 1.3 million people in the next few years. They're going to need a place to stay. It makes sense. So that was really how I got started. And luckily, even though my dad is quite conservative and my mom is quite risque, I have parents who allow me make mistakes now, <laughs> now that I'm out of their house. So it's like when I tell them about something exciting, as long as the research is there and I've checked with people, they're like, go for it, mm, you'll be fine. And so that's how, honestly, I started building <laughs> well, Can you unpack a little bit of what you said about why you felt you needed to get insurance and like what type of insurance before you kind of thought a little bit more about building well? So it was a new, I would say, uh, horizon for me. So when I talked to this financial advisor, he explained how much one uh, 
accident for, per se at work is something could cost you. So you could start investing, have all this money in, in, in growth um, vehicles, and then you have a situation like cancer or something that is quite damaging and that will start to take a lot of that investment you thought you had for your retirement or for the kids so it was good to have some type of insurance which a lot of employers have and again i was that immigrant who was like sign the daughter check i only care about my base and now and so what it taught me too was to realize that some of these things were things to negotiate in the offer stage it, it wasn't a one-size-fits-all so this financial advisor had me bring my benefits book from the work and like explain what all those things mean, what I had, what I didn't have, what we needed to get based on age and things like that. So if there's like a threatening accident or a, a life situation where we lose someone very key in the family, who's going to take care of those funeral expenses and sorts. So before we start investing money, something to consider um, just so that you are not going to just lose all of it all at once because something unplanned for happens. Yeah, very good, very, very good advice. You know, critical illness, a disability, a death can really derail a lot of things. And especially in your moment of grief, right? You don't want to be thinking about right. the bills and how they're racking up. Janie, you also talked about starting on your real estate journey. And Danica, you talked about how you bought a condo at 25. Any any learnings in that, in doing that, that you want to share with the group? Again, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? <laughs> Yeah, I had a relatively, um, you know, easy and smooth experience. Um, I'll just be fully transparent. I bought it at, in 2015 at a time where downtown Toronto was reasonably affordable. I got a place for like 250 grand. So I was just really, really grateful for that because obviously right now that's that's just not a thing. Um, but yeah, I would say uh, the main things that I would share were um, I definitely uh, leveraged my RRSP, the first time home buyers plan to make sure that, you know, that would help me with uh, the fees and the down payment. Um, I also made sure that as soon as I bought my home, I had a will, I took out a will. Um, I made sure that things would be taken care of, like you said, uh, Janie, in the case of, you know, an accident or things like that. That was really important to me. Um, but one thing I actually really wanted to touch on, Janie, is how you said that uh, you had, when you were um, kind of accepting your salary, you really only cared about the base, the base salary. Um, and I can really relate to that because there was a point where I was just like, I don't care about anything else. Just what is, what are you going to pay me? And, you know, as I've really redefined wealth as a millennial woman, I realized that there's so much more to the base. Like you really have to look at all of those other things. Uh, you need to understand like stock options, RSUs, things like that, benefits. And, I just really want to encourage units. folks to, yeah, I, I had no idea what, you know, stock units were. And I didn't really uh, factor that into like my decision to an ex accept an offer because I'm just like, that's an afterthought. Just what are you going to pay me? But those are the things that create wealth. Those are very large. They can be very large, you know, lump sums of money that can help you, you know, later down the line, purchase property or, you know, contribute to those retirement funds. So I wanted to touch on that as well, because that really resonated with me because I was totally like, What's the base? I don't care about anything else. And I should really have been paying attention to, you know, the total compensation. Yeah. Right. So important. And so important. Right. Um, I, I didn't want to interrupt. Yeah. Did someone want to add to that? Uh, no, just on the, on the concept of how the real estate journey, I would say, I think for me, uh, I have this whole cultural thing in Nigeria. There's no mortgages. You want a house, you build one. And that was what I grew up on. And it was like, and you build one and typically people build one. Once they have families, they've gotten into some type of money, then they build a house. So it was not even a thing I was immediately considering as soon as I hit the shores of Canada. However, once we got, I knew that once we got married, it was something we want to start looking at either getting a house. And I wish I knew this earlier. I think if you guys had watched this show on Netflix, marriages versus mortgages, I always thought it's a no brainer. But I was that person who actually chose marriage instead of a mortgage. So my advice to you, if you're listening, is look at a house first, especially if you live in Canada before marriage. I'm telling you right now, because of the, 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 the way the, the interest, the compound interest on a, a marriage bill versus like a mortgage is a no brainer now. But uh, how we got started was after getting married, we decided it's something we want to start looking into. And the market has been crazy. We haven't still hit something. But I know that uh, look, now looking back, it's something I would have considered first. Um, for the manager, I just wanted to add that. 
Wow. Yeah. That's important too. I think like, you know, taking that investment to build for yourself before a relationship or even in a relationship. So just to kind of extend on that, Janie, how do you talk about relationships? You know, you're newly married. What were some of those conversations that you had navigating money in relationships, in your relationship? Spill the tea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Where are your cops? <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so, First of all, I have to say that nothing, nothing can prep you for the reality of this. You need Jesus, period. Um, no, for real, actually. <laughs> um, no, in all, okay, in all seriousness, uh, we went through like counseling because we're Christian. So you go through counseling and they talk about the different aspects of marriage. Because I always say like, if you're going to take an exam, you take prep courses anyway. So for marriage, I think you should do the same because you don't know what you're walking into. However, that in itself still can prep you for the reality, but it gives you a good sense. So we had conversations around money handling, um, who's, what are financial roles? Because I grew up in a situation where my dad was a provider, even though really he paid just tuition and mom covered everything else. So, but what does that really mean for us? We had a lot of conversation about that. We talked about the power money has in relationships. It literally is number one reason for divorce and things of that sort. So it's like, what are we going to let money do for us and what is it not going to do for us? Um, but in reality, it's different after all that conversation because your partner may be dealing with a different money story that they have not even come to terms with. Mm. And all that lovely doveness and my marriage prep can also blind you from having and doing the deeper conversation. So for me, I, all I could do was just think about who, the first thing I wanted my brother, my son to be with and prep myself to be that person. Because really, that's all you really can control. And from somebody who loves to control money and save, I realized that it really wasn't completely up to me of what my partner was going to do. I could pray and hope and teach and talk, but the reality is always different, especially if some people don't know enough or on a different level or in a different perspective. However, my advice to anyone who's thinking about getting married, especially people from our community where money is such a taboo to talk about, where it's a lot of things you find out after the fact is you rather find that sooner rather than later. So ask all the uncomfortable conversations. Talk about credit reports. How do we feel about our credit scores, our debt? How are we going to handle the debt that have now become ours together? Um, talk about taboo things like prenups and just get a sense of what people feel about that. Just so you know, it's because a lot of times in our community, it's like, I don't want to talk about it. No, it's okay to talk about it. Just know where each other stand because when things hit the fan, and it will happen, I think that's one thing that's guaranteed in marriage. It's like, what are you going to do? Um, and I think a lot of people don't want to talk about it. It's painful. It's not part of the fun process of planning a wedding or a marriage, but I'd say, listen, man, you got to do what you got to do. That's my <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. You know, tons of conversations like getting into a marriage that you have to talk about money. Um, Janine, you know, congratulations. I know you have a new bundle of joy, you know, and, you know, that also means talking about children, how you plan to do all that kind of stuff. How are you and your partner really discussing money when it comes to kids? Yeah, he. Our little one is growing up so fast. He starts daycare soon. And I'm just like, I don't know where the time has gone. So um, we're very in love with him um, and very also aware of the costs of having a kid. Um, I think I always knew daycare was going to be expensive. I don't know if I knew how expensive daycare is. So for us, it's going to be $1,600 a month and we're in Calgary, um, which by the time he enters grade one, we will have spent uh, close to six figures on childcare, uh, which wow. when you think about it in those terms, it's kind of crazy to think of what parents could actually be doing with that money, right? Like $100,000 could pay down a lot of a mortgage or could uh, set a child up for university costs. Um, so, you know, in this first year of his life, we've really focused on trying to contribute as much as we can to his RESP to get those grants matched from the government, which is a great tool for anyone who has a little one. Um, and, you know, as we move into this daycare phase, I think we're going to have to be patient with ourselves and understand that, you know, if we have to pull back on savings for a little bit, like this is a temporary period in our life where it is just 
incredibly ex expensive. And this is why, you know, things like that $10 a day daycare that um, the Liberals are trying to, um, I guess, expand across Canada are so critically important to families building wealth because, yeah, $100,000, like I can think of a lot of things that I would like to do with $100,000 as opposed to just paying for childcare. Um, and, you know, we cover education for our children from K to 12. So why is, you know, one to five any different, right? Like they're going to these early childhood centers. I think those should be, um, you know, covered as uh, families are raising the next generation of, of taxpayers, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And just like as, as citizens, right? I think it's so important mm -hmm. that we give options to women um, and families and parents, right? To give that support that having, you're not really saying, can I afford debt or a child? Like that, you know, those aren't kind of questions that we really want to be having as, as Canadians. No. No, but, you know, we don't just talk about money in romantic relationships. We have it in all forms of relationships. Um, so I want to talk to you, Danica, like what, how do you talk about money with friends or do you talk about money with friends or is that a taboo topic? It is a taboo topic, but I do it anyway. <laughs> um, you know, in, in my friends group, um, in the beginning, I'm, I'm, I've been friends with my closest friends for like 10 plus years. I think they were definitely uncomfortable with how often I spoke about money, I spoke about things like salaries and bills and budgets and things like that. But over time, they've definitely become more comfortable. And, you know, we regularly discuss things like salary negotiations. Um, you know, sometimes if they're looking for new jobs, we'll kind of all do the exercise together to, you know, dig up all of the different tools we can use to see, okay, what is the going rate for someone, you know, of my value? And we'll like dig in deep to like LinkedIn, or uh, I just learned about something called uh, levels.fyi, which is another really cool tool that you can use for uh, salaries and understanding, you know, what, what you're worth and what you can be paid. So yeah, we are very, very open with money in my friends group. Um, people often in my friends group look to me as kind of like the financial advisor to kind of help them budget and figure things out. Um, and my approach to it is just being very non-judgmental, being empathetic, and also not encouraging people to like nickel and dime their way through life, you know, like I never want to make people feel guilty if they do want to splurge on a new Gucci bag or something like that. It's just, you know, making sure that you're budgeting for it and that you can afford it and you're not spending 100% of your money on this, but saving for the things that really matter most to you. And also investing in things and experience as well. Uh, for example, travel is a really big thing for me and my friends group. Um, I was very, uh, last year, actually, I took a five month trip around uh, Southeast Asia and I was very transparent with my friends as well about how much that costs because those are things that they're interested in as well. So just really being very open with how much I spend, how much I make, so we can all really transparently understand what the possibilities are. I love it. I love that. I love that. We I need to it. talk about it. We 100% need to talk about it. Just the same strength we talk about other things, we really need to talk about money. So I just got one last question for, for you women here. It's a really short one. One word, one word answer. Would you consider yourself a saver, a spender, or investor? Janie. Investor. Let's do it. Seed, be it. <laughs> <laughs> Janine. Investor. Investor. I love it. And Danica. Investor, make my money, make money. <laughs> make my money, make money. Oh, wow. So yes, being an investor, so, so, so critical. So again, everybody continue the conversation here, put it into the chat, you know, use the hashtag badass investor or investor mindset to continue this conversation. Reach out to these three. Thank you again, Janie, Janine and Danica for this conversation. So excited and let's all continue the conversation right here as we talk more about building wealth and investing in your legacy.